Coming up on this week's show, improve the look of your Xbox and Super Nintendo. A Disney classic comes to the Amiga. And we go inside the world of edutainment with Arthur creator, Mark Brown. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of my favourite books they've ever done, Commodore Amiga, a visual compendium, a real celebration of the legendary 16-bit machine covering early titles like Defender of the Crown, Barbarian, Marble Madness, and then those later iconic titles, Cannon Fodder, Speedball, Worms, and lots more as well over 420 pages. We'll tell you more about that in just a bit, but you can check out the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 379, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And really nice to have you joining us for another nostalgic look back at the classic age of video games. And of course, we're bringing you right up to date with everything that's been going on, all the big headlines in the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last seven days. That's how the podcast works. First half, we do a little round table talking about the news stories that have been making the headlines this week. And then the second half of the podcast is where this show really comes into its own. When we welcome on a veteran to give us their story and share some of the memories of the incredible titles they've worked on. Now, today is a little bit different. And I've got to admit, after doing this podcast for uh, coming up on eight years, this is probably the only time that my wife has been really impressed with a guest that we've had on this podcast, being that she grew up watching the TV series Arthur. And when I mentioned we're going to have the creators of Arthur on the podcast, over the weekend, she was basically walking around the house singing the theme song for about two hours straight. <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, what a wonderful kind of day. Oh, God, hey. here we go. <laughs> Where you learn, learn heavy, and play. Heavy metal hey. Joe there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rhythm of now, the you beat. <laughs> you, you might be wondering, well, hang on, why, why are they on a video games podcast? But actually, there is a real big history with Arthur, the TV series, and edutainment titles, isn't there, Evan? Yeah, it was... So Arthur's interesting because it was the longest running children's animated TV series in the US. Uh, 26 years. Yeah, which is huge. And out of those years, you know, there's about 15 games that came spanning from 94 to 2002. And edutainment is, it's an interesting world because, you know, it, it's something that got packaged with stuff. You know, a, a lot of people's excuses for buying a computer was a, uh, education and uh you know i'm gonna do my homework on it and stuff and i'm <laughs> sure a lot of the alpha games also got sold with that and uh, you know encourage parents to buy it but interesting broader bund as well um we're doing a lot of the alpha games and there's a whole connection there with stuff like user interfaces and uh of course the changing of digital media over the time uh from 1994 to 2002 you know you know you're going from like disc to CD-ROM and then stuff's really developing. You're able to add more stuff in there. It's it's, it's a really interesting interview, actually. Yeah, so we catch up with um, Mark Brown, who was the, the creator of Arthur, and his son Tolon as well. Now, it's really interesting. We hear the story about how he came up with the character of Arthur that was basically a bedtime story for Tolon when he was a kid back in the 70s. And obviously it started as books and then went into uh, an animated TV series. We even touch on, I mean, obviously when that started in the 90s, it was kind of the tail end of traditional animation, wasn't it? Where mm. stuff was yeah. hand drawn. And it was one of the last shows that still stuck with that. You know, mm. um, it, it, it stuck out a lot longer than other ones did. Yeah. And then they made that transition to digital. And we're here. So it's quite interesting. They actually did the, uh, the animation for it in Flash. Yeah. Which kind of blew my for, mind a little for bit. A TV you know, show, yeah. Yeah, we make websites in that. So we hear about that. And also, of course, the video games too. Now, we did a whole episode um, a couple of months ago with Mickey Mantle talking about the Broderbund Living Book series. It's, of course, been brought back on a you know Zoom platform now and um, also on platforms like the Nintendo Switch. So a lot of the classic Arthur games have been remastered and brought back for a new generation. So it is a really interesting discussion. And also, Kind of, you know, you think back to those early entertainment games. It was for a lot of kids that was their first time sitting down and learning stuff like, you know, how to use a computer mouse and how to click on things on a screen and how to operate a computer, stuff that becomes valuable life skills. Well, I guess that's maybe why that kind of Arthur Fist meme 
is uh, yeah. so relevant because you know <laughs> people remember that from when they were kids and then they all came online and started sharing it as a, as a kind of symbol of rage um yeah it, it, it's really interesting the whole way it kind of plays into the digital culture and i think that arthur fist is actually the same thing i do when like one of my computers doesn't work properly so um <laughs> yeah there's a really interesting chat so you're going to be catching up with uh, mark and Tolon brown the guys behind arthur and they're hearing all about the re-release of the living books as well they're going to be on the podcast in around half an hour from now now, of course, before that, we'd like to bring it up to speed on what's been happening retro-wise over the last week. And as technology improves, I mean, we're all guys, I think, you know, I think it's fair to say most of us enjoy playing on our original systems. I mean, we all use emulation from time to time, but us guys have definitely got a lot of original hardware. And it's always nice when you get new solutions to connect your classic systems to more modern displays and also make the visuals look a bit nicer as well, because that is one problem that we've got. I mean, CRT monitors and CRT TVs, as great as they are, they're not going to be around forever. So I think it is important that we do have ways of connecting them to more modern displays. And this one looks like a really good solution for the original Xbox. This is the Eon XB HD adapter. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting thing because it's not only a, a kind of upscaler or adapter, you know, uh, it's specifically designed for the Xbox. And um, mm. the way that it works is, you know, the Xbox signal, um, it, it takes it out and it kind of improves it. So you can get to like 480i and uh, even 1080i as well. And it's got that lagless input. So this is, it's it's, it's a bit of an expensive device, 152 um, pounds. And, you know, that's, that's going to be for the real Xbox hardcore fan. But I think there's a killer feature in here that um, uh, a lot of people haven't kind of mentioned, which is um, it's it's got the Ethernet support, but it's got a free Ethernet LAN ports. So you can have your Xbox and then you can have three other Ethernet ports connected to it, which means you can actually have LAN games and LAN parties like old school Xbox style of course, there's no Xbox servers anymore. So, you know, you can recreate that old LAN vibe that you had with your friends, set that up, uh, play Halo 2, um, you know, some of the old classic ones. I used to love the whole Xbox on online experience as well. Um, interestingly as well, it's got the uh, mini, mini Toslink audio jack, which is the headphones and the kind of um, uh, way that you would speak on on the xbox as well so i'm sure there's going to be lots of like uh potential made for this and and services and i think it's it's really interesting as well if you've seen all the generations of xbox they can all connect and like play some games with each other as well which is interesting so i can imagine this ethernet port you know someone might put three generations of xbox <laughs> connected to this device and then <laughs> be able to have this like crazy LAN with all, all the different systems. That's an interesting point. So if you played like, you know, a, an old original Xbox game on an Xbox Series X, could you actually play it? Yeah, I, I think they're that? cross compatible. So I went to, okay, X, uh, I went to Play Expo and they had like 360s that were connected to the original ones that were then connected right. to the modern ones as well. I think um, MVG's done a few videos on it as well, how you can still kind of connect them all up. It is very cool, though, because it basically means, yeah, you can have, you know, a, a LAN with a couple of original Xbox without needing a router connected up. So literally you just plug it into, you know, this adapter yeah. here. Great for events like Play Expo, that kind of thing, where, you know, retro gaming conventions where you might want this kind of setup. Um, I do think it's very cool that it actually looks like the aesthetic of it mirrors the look of the original Xbox. Yeah, it's mm. not just a plain box. Yeah. No. So it really means that you can play those original Xbox games in much higher visual quality than you could before as well. It's actually got two outputs there too, which I think is going to be very useful for streamers. Mm -hmm. So obviously you can put yeah. one to your TV or you display and one into your, your streaming setup as well. So um, I saw Metal Jesus share this on his Facebook page the other day. That's where I spotted this. And he's quite excited about it. Um, there were quite a few people saying, you know, wouldn't it be better to spend your money on something like a frame meister? You know, if you've actually got a few different retro systems that you want to use it on, obviously I think it would be. But, you know, if you've got, you know, a real hardcore original Xbox fan, 
And um, this looks like it will be a nice little expansion for it. As yeah, well, I so. think I think like if you had a frame meister or, or one of the things, you wouldn't get the features of the extra Ethernet, and you and you wouldn't get the uh, you know quality audio as well of the uh, yeah. mini Toslink and the two outputs. So you know um, it's it's got a lot more bang for its buck if you're a kind of Xbox person. But then it's not as general use, I guess, as of ones. Uh- I'll be interested to see because it boasts that it's got um, zero zero lag. Like, you know, there's no latency on the input. So, you know, controller inputs appear on the screen instantly. Um, not many of them can boast that, you know, with their like HD, you know, upgrades and stuff like that. Sometimes there is kind of like a, you know, a few nanoseconds, a split second kind of like delay. And, you know, when you kind of look at that and you kind of go, oh, so, you know, it's not that bad. But when you actually sit there and you play it, like, you know, when you watch people like Metal Jesus kind of showing off other ones, which I won't name, and there is that kind of like latency, you kind of think to yourself like, oh, that's not too bad. But when you actually play it, you really do feel it. So, yeah. you know, these guys, they're saying that that's not the case. It is going to be seamless, you know, and I don't know if that's because of it's specifically designed for the original Xbox and it's not one of these ones that, you know, has a switchboard on it or a switcher or anything like that. So it works on, you know, several different consoles or anything like that. So once people start kind of putting out their their reviews of it and stuff like that, it'd be interesting to see that. Um, that could explain the, the high price of it as well, the mm. fact that it's, you know, high-quality components and you haven't got that lag there as well. Yeah. And it's making me look at this thing. Yeah, you know, I like to get this on my original Xbox, although the Xbox that Joe promised me did sell at the Birmingham gaming market over the weekend. <laughs> I promised yeah. it you like a year ago, Dan. <laughs> Just saying, Joe. <laughs> I've got some, one somewhere in the cupboard. I'm sure it's still works. Um, but yeah, if you're fan of the original Xbox, um, pre-orders are open for this now. I mean, you mentioned about the price, 152.95 Great British Pounds. So you can actually pre-order on their website at the moment and join a queue. And they reckon they're going to start um, shipping orders early next month, by the looks of it, early uh, early June. So uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to check it out. The new Eon XBHD Xbox HD adapter looks very cool. Now, Tim Stamper the co-founder of Rare, and before that, Ultimate Play the Game. He's been a little tease on Twitter lately, hasn't he? Oh, yeah, people aren't happy with him, are they? I know. <laughs> What's he been doing now? What's he been doing now? So I think we've uh, we've spoke about him on the news. God, must be the third time now in like two months. Mm. Um, so he's clearly gone through his attic or through his garage or something and just dug out some absolute treasures. Now, obviously a few people have got a little bit annoyed about this, but there is... Really, there's quite a simple ex- explanation to to. I think, I think, I think people online will get annoyed if you breathe. You know. Yeah, well, there's, there, there <laughs> yeah. is that as well. But anyway, what he's got is he has got the, and it's funny because we spoke about Space World on last week's episode. He has got the 19 only on the patrons bit. Only on the patrons bit. <laughs> Sign up if you want to hear that part. <laughs> so he has got the 1997 Space World Zelda cartridge which is labelled as Zelda N64. So this is... Remind Ravi what Space World was again. So Space World was Nintendo's kind of E3 before Nintendo joined, started going to E3. So it was kind of like their their, um, their expo to showcase what games they had coming out and what consoles and, you know, tech that Nintendo had coming out. Um, And it was in Japan. And obviously Rare used to have a really close relationship with uh, Nintendo, obviously, you know, they did all the Donkey Kong Country games and the Conkers games and everything like that. So it's no surprise that he's got some really interesting bits of treasure from Nintendo, which were probably gifted to him over the years or or even just given to him. At, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he was there at Space World in 1997. So this cartridge famously has like a really early tech demo for Ocarina of Time on it, which never actually came out. Like the, what's featured on it was never in Ocarina of Time, which is obviously a highly regarded game on, you know, on if not the best Zelda game, one of the best Zelda games in the world. But the reason people are getting really upset with him is he's showing it off. He's got to put a picture of it on Twitter and the nice massive development kit N64 cartridge. And then he's got it on a CRT screen in the background. And he's just got the title screen running there in the background, which looks incredibly different to what we've got in the end. You can see the Triforce in the background. That's not what the menu looked like in Ocarina of Time. Because I guess this was before they even knew it was going to be Ocarina of Time. This was just, it was Zelda 64 at this point. Yeah. But people are getting really upset with him because of, you know, he's done, he did, I can't remember the name of it, but he did a game a couple of weeks ago. He's done Conker's Bad Fur Day. He's done all sorts of games. And and if you look at this screenshot he's done on Twitter, actually, there is in the background, there's a Mario, Mario. 1996 N64 cartridge. Yeah, as well. yeah, Mario 1996, as well as four sealed copies of Zelda Ocarina of Time. 
Um, so, you know, some big price tags on that if he wanted to sell this kind of stuff. So people are getting really upset because of, he keeps teasing these things and he's not dumping the footage or if he does show any well, footage, he's literally showing yeah, like three, I, I four think, seconds you of know, it. You know, you're the head of a big company. You can't mm. dump ROMs of stuff uh, and, 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 from and, Nintendo. You might not even own these carts. And I think it's good that he's putting it out because people are getting yeah. to see what the cart is, what the title screen is. Yeah. And I think it's it's probably a bit of like, I want to play that, you know, that's... yeah driving this um but yeah i don't see anything wrong with it you know he's just he's one of the top kind of heads of the array you know? it's yeah like, exactly. yeah you know and, and, of course he's gonna have stuff in the loft he, of course he's gonna have these things and the thing is there's a lot of comments people moaning about it and they're like he's not even dumped it what if the cartridge breaks what if it dies etc and you're just like the guy was one of the heads of rare and they were such a innovative company he probably has dumped them onto a hard drive. I bet has you they've them got up. a huge archive of absolutely everything digitally done and their exactly. own servers and all of this kind exactly. of stuff. But also, he, it might not be his property. You know, yeah, you could and, get gifted these at Space World and then it is, it could, who knows whose rights are maintained yeah, for something and like if that. He, if he, uh, no doubt, undoubtedly, if he suddenly just went, yeah, I'm ripping, ripping Zelda 64 and you know, Mario 1996 and Conker's Bad Fur Day 95 and all this kind of stuff. Here you go. He'll, Nintendo will come for him straight away, I imagine. <laughs> so, you well, know. yeah, you'd probably ruin future partnerships and all of that. Exactly. And trust as well. You know, you've got yeah. to have trust with that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, so. I think it's, it's, it's kind of good that he's showing these things. And um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I just think it's people wanting to obviously have that version in their, in their mm-hmm. kind of private hands as well. Yeah, or which just, makes sense. And I mean, I, I've seen some, you know, there's people who've been threatened to rob his house and everything oh to get God. them, which, you know, is just... Yeah, people that's take it too far, you. don't yeah. they? Yeah. <laughs> it is. And I mean, look, I'm looking at this, and I think, yeah, it is very cool that he's showing it off. I do think in, in some ways it would be nice if he had the time to maybe sh- just show a little bit more footage, you know, watching a little YouTube playthrough of 10 minutes of it would be great. But again, I mean, Nintendo's lawyers have took down <laughs> videos and ROM sites for less than that in the past, haven't they? Yeah. So... I understand why he might be erring on the side of caution, as it were. Um, but I do think it is very cool that he is at least showing off some of these very cool, rare N64 titles on his Twitter feed. So um, I'm sure there'll be more of them on the way over the next few months. I'm sure he's got quite a few in there. So if you want to check out the uh, the tweets so far, I'll uh, link that up in our show notes and on your podcast app, head to theretrohour.com. Now, we talked about the Xbox mod, if you'd like your original Xbox will look a bit nicer. What about this? This is a new Super Nintendo modification that apparently fixes one of the biggest problems that people had with the SNES's output. So I, I, this, I've had to read this about three or four times to try and get my head around it. So I didn't, I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm not a modder. I don't know the ins and outs of inputs and outputs and sound and, you know, like the aspect ratio and stuff. I'm not very good with this kind of stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple guy with simple pleasures. But this SNES mod, it sounds quite interesting. So I've been on a bit of a, a learning, you know, journey here. So when the Super Nintendo launched, you know, 30 years ago now, re- not too long ago, it celebrated its 30th anniversary in, uh, I think it was last year, there was two different chips, two different variants of the Super Nintendo, which I wasn't aware of. So there was the one chip and the two chip. What mm. it was is the one chip was actually a better quality chip and the two chip wasn't as clear. Um, and it actually produced some like kind of like blurriness on the screen um and some sound blurriness they kind of describe it as it just wasn't quite as good and as as a result probably a cost reduced version i imagine yeah yeah and, that, and right? as a result the chip one models actually go for more money which i wasn't i wasn't aware of this at all so mm. really really interesting but what this mod does which has been engineered by an engineer called voltar is it is to resolve the blurriness of the chip two. So it's a it is a mod, a soldering mod to to the chip two, and it's called the the two chip edge enhancer, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, and I, I don't know how he does it because I'm not that kind of guy. Maybe you guys um, can yeah yeah. Share so some it, insight it, on that. it works with the DAC, which is the uh, digital analog converter, which basically uh, converts the signal. But um, what he's saying, I think, in this one is that. Um, Usually it's a low-pass filter that's boosted, which is mm. a, a kind of filter that's a, a, applied on top of it, and that kind of sharpens the image. But he's not done it that way. I think he's gone directly into into the DAC, and um, he's he's kind of 
done that. But he also says that it doesn't um, fully solve the issue of noise. You know? Right. Um, uh, that seems to be something that's going to always affect the, um, uh, the yeah, snares. I don't think, you know, these machines were designed to go on CRTVs and also to work with, um, you know, the what people had in their houses and the kind of uh, lowest common denominator. So uh, you're never going to get that, like, beautifully yeah. kind of sharp one unless you go and update the chips or replace them or, you know, really, really get into there or... If you're upscaling it, you're still kind of adding a filter or you're doing it with software. You know, it's it's a really tough thing to do. And uh, well, He has shared some um, images of what the modification looks like um, on Twitter. And, I mean, the difference is, you know, it is definitely noticeable. But, yeah, I think, you know, you are right, Ravi. It's, uh, you know, basically these machines were designed usually to be played on 14-inch crappy TVs that we had in our bedroom by RF. Yeah. Mm. So visual fidelity wasn't a big high priority for them back then, was it? So... I think the fact that, you know, this looks like quite an affordable solution. I mean, obviously, you could run it through something like a Frymeister or a, a Retro Tink and it might look nicer, but it looks like, you know, this is just quite a simple little board. Yeah, I think board the only way wires. that you ever kind of get perfect images is usually when you have emulation with, like, loads of stuff added into them software-wise, you know, yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of changes it rather than getting it from the OG hardware, especially with the SNES as well and... uh yeah, so other stuff you can tap directly into it, but it seems like this is a real issue with the with the actual chips on the board. Yeah, and when you're taking analog signals and trying to, you know, upscale them to, you know, 65-inch HD TVs that we've got today, there's definitely always going to be some artifacts there. But, um, yeah, it does look like it's, you know, a really interesting project and is a work in progress as well. Because their Voltoid is quite a lot on the... Um, Nintendo scene. He's, he's actually the guy that's been kind of rescuing these uh, bricked Wii U's recently as well. Uh, you might have seen his uh, his project on that, his videos too. So um, yeah, it does look very cool. And I think you know if you, if you want a nicer way to look at your Super Nintendo, because I think even when I hook it up via Skype, you know, on a CRT, now now I think about it, there is often a little bit kind of blurriness there. So if we can even clean that up, you know, for an affordable price, it will be worth doing. And the installation of it doesn't look that difficult. It looks like it's literally soldering like two it's wires. It's kind of like an old mod chip, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the installation. Yeah, probably easier than most of those were, to be fair. So um, that's some work in progress. We'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that one for you. Now, I'm interested to hear Joe's thoughts on this next story because uh, this is another Scorpion Engine game <laughs> that is coming to the Amiga. This is actually a rather famous Sega Mega Drive game, Forest of Illusion. The Mickey Mouse game is getting a port to the Amiga. You, you're right and you're wrong, Dan. <laughs> As always. As always. So Forest of Illusion is the title of this game that is coming to the Amiga on the Scorpion engine, like you say, and it looks looks awesome. Um, so there was Castle of Illusion for the Mega Drive and World of Illusion for the Mega Drive. Yeah. Then there was Land of Illusion for the Game Gear and there's some other Japanese ones and stuff for the Game Gear and stuff like that. And so there wasn't a Forest of Illusion back was, in the day. There wasn't no, a Forest of Illusion. Name. So okay. this is a new name. And it, and but it it you know, it is an of illusion game. It's using the of illusion assets and style and everything like and that. The and the sprites and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it look this looks really fantastic. So it's being made by um Dom Kid. Who um, he's been behind some other lot loads of other kind of Scorpion engine mods. I think he did the Castlevania one, um, which picked up some traction uh, earlier this year or last year, which was really really cool. Um, so at the moment, it's just kind of like in a beta stage, and he's just like sent like a minute video out to a lot of people, and a lot of people are like, oh my god, it's using like World of Illusion um, assets and stuff like that. This looks so awesome. It looks really good on the Amiga. It's got really nice parallax scrolling on there, which is really cool to see. But as you've just said, you guys have just said, it's got Mickey Mania assets in there as well. So it's actually using the Mickey Mouse himself as the sprite from Mickey Mania, which came out on like Snares, Mega Drive. It even came out on PS1. But then the backgrounds that are being used are from um, Castle of Illusion. But then he's obviously kind of building his own levels out of it. And so far, we've got a forest level. And if you look at it, you just go, oh yeah, it's like a Mega Drive game or a Snares game. But the fact that it's running on the Amiga... And it's just it's just the scrolling that everybody seems to be going crazy for, which I think re- looks really cool. I think it looks nice. It, it runs well, but um, it's going to get taken down. Um, Do you reckon? Like, oh, 100%. Like, even more than... If you think Nintendo's bad, um, Disney, woof. Do not, <laughs> just do not touch Mickey, basically. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, 
if I was him, like I think it's a really good effort. But if he'd um, if he'd kind of you know got it to a complete stage, then re- released it really quickly and went under the radar. But um, I think I think there was a story in the nineties that Disney sued a council for making a Mickey Mouse um, uh, image out of flowers. On <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> yeah. That's so that's like literally, <laughs> they are that hardcore. Yeah, but technically, it looks amazing. Like this is the great thing about Amiga development now you've got these engines like Scorpion that are are really pushing stuff and of course you've got that great history like Aladdin and stuff that came out on the Amiga um, Mm. that 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 looks really beautiful and this this adds to it I'd love to see it as a main release I just I just don't think it's possible like legally yeah I guess it might might have been better for him to have finished it then put it out but the fact that it's picking up traction like way before it's even yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying, Ravi. But it looks cool, and it just, yeah. once again, just goes to show, like, you know, what the Amiga could have done with a little bit more effort, you know, when it's like, there's all these, like, Street Fighter 2 mods coming out and Final Fight mods, and I'm just like, what do you mean the Amiga could do this? And you guys are just like, yeah, it could. It was just everything Yeah, and that, that, it parala- that parallax <laughs> is just beautiful. Yeah. And he's not given much information on this, and I mean, you know, we'll just put it out there that he hasn't said he's releasing this. No, you know, it true. It might just be something he's showing off. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, yeah. video at the moment. But yeah, I mean, it hasn't really given any information apart from it's built on the Scorpion engine. I mean, to me, I'm looking at this and thinking, is do you think this is like Amiga 1200 only, like AGA? Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it could have been for one of the later, more advanced Amiga. I think there's too many colours um, uh, there for it to be um, ECS yeah, be but, or OCS, but I've been wrong on many occasions <laughs> with that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it would be, I'd, I'd enjoy playing this. I mean, in terms of the, the speed of it as well, because I mean, I did play those games back in the day. I mean, actually, it was probably more Fantasia that we played on the Mega Drive, which I you know is probably considered the worst one, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> um, in, t- in terms of the speed, I mean, would you say it's comparable? It looks a bit slow to me, but in my mind, I'm thinking maybe I, I'm picturing the Mega Drive games as quicker. I would, let me have another look. I watched it earlier. It looks a bit Rayman-y kind of speed to me. Yeah, you know, like it is. Walk it's, along, dum da dum you know. Kind I don't of. know. I'd say... When he's walking along, I'd say it's probably on spa, on par with them because they're they're not the fastest games like Hassle and World of Illusion. But when he's swinging, um, there's like some animations of where he's swinging that looks a little bit choppier, a little bit slower. Um, so overall, I'd probably have to say it's slightly slower, maybe. But it it just it looks really nice, you know. I know it's got the Scorpion engine and all that stuff. People are probably going, "Joe, Scorpion engine's there," but it does look really good. Yeah, definitely, definitely one of the Very most polished impressive. platformers. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we'll keep an eye on that if it ever comes out. So uh, keep it down the down, keep it hush hush. So uh, Forest of Illusion for the Amiga um, may come out one day, might not. But you can check the video out right now, and I'll put that in our show notes. And everything else we talk about, you don't have to Google around for them. I save you the effort. I put them in our show notes on your podcast app or head to the retrohour dot com. Now talking of the Amiga, um, you know if you ask anyone, I actually saw this on a Facebook group the other day. People was like, you know, recommend me a good Amiga book. Everyone mentioned Commodore Amiga. A visual compendium that is, of course, made by our wonderful sponsor, our longest running sponsor of the Retro Hour podcast, our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, just how good is this book if you're a fan of Amiga games? Oh, it's absolutely quality. Like, just for, for me, it's like the, the hardback presentation of it is lovely and, and the material and the case. But just seeing some of these games, like the sprite zoomed in and the kind of, oh, just just how they've presented the images of it it's is absolutely gorgeous and if you're a fan of amiga gaming i mean obviously the amiga came out in 1985 it kind of covers you know from the earliest days of the amiga you know groundbreaking titles like cinema wares defender of the crown yes yeah. you know, like, no one has seen jim, anything jim like that sax's like art yeah absolutely yeah, lovely oh jim michael worked on that as well and then those kind of Arcade perfect conversions of games like Marble Madness and Rainbow Islands as well. They really showed off, you know, just how good the Amiga could be as a home platform. And then, you know, kind of my era of the Amiga when I got into it in the 90s, stuff like, you know, Cannon Fodder. X, and X Copy is even in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, that's the thing. I mean, the cover, you know, it's 420 pages covering all the big Amiga games, 140 of the biggest titles brought to life, but also. Beyond the games, it covers stuff like, you know, the demo scene and, you know, interviews with artists and profiles of the big games publishers. And like all of Bitmap Books books, it uses high quality lithographic printing on gorgeous paper as well. So it's a real celebration of the visual look of the Amiga. And it's got contributions from some of the biggest names in Amiga history in here. You know, there are loads of them. So if you're a fan of the Amiga and you haven't got this in your book collection, 
have a look at this book and, of course, the rest of their retro gaming collection and uh, support the podcast by showing our sponsors a bit of love. You can check out Commodore Amiga, a visual compendium at bitmapbooks.com. Now, this month has absolutely flown by. I can't believe the final weekend of May already. And usually... We'd be gearing up to do our patrons hangout this weekend. You know, we normally do it on the last Sunday of the month. However, there has been a slight change of plan because um, I'm at Pixel Heaven this weekend in Poland. My flight doesn't get me back until around 7.30 on Sunday night. And uh, Joe's lovely boss is making him work till 10pm on Sunday night this weekend now. So I do let the patrons know. It seems everyone's quite on board with it. But we are actually having a bit of a change of plan as to when we do the hangout this weekend, aren't we? Yeah, so we are going to be doing it on Sunday the 4th of June. Which does mean there's going to be yeah. two in June, so we're not going to skip yeah. a month for anything like that. We are just a week behind, and uh, as you say, you've let the the patrons know, so we're really sorry about that. I couldn't have yeah. tried and tried to swap, and then I messaged Dan. Dan was like, "Yeah, I'm getting back later than I thought I was anyway." <laughs> so, yeah, we we kind of uh we kind of messed up there, but luckily, going to be two in June instead. So fourth uh, Sunday the fourth, and then we're going to look at um, either doing the last Friday or the last Sunday of June, aren't we? as well yeah um to make sure everybody gets involved but what do we do on the hangout dan there you go we'll oh, put it on you for once the hangout. <laughs> well that's the thing i mean i'm actually pleased that we're moving this because you know at first it's like, oh, i'm gonna miss the hangout if my flight doesn't get me back in time you know and uh i, I, I would have had to airport. do it solo <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so it's good yeah, yeah so it means we can all be on it you know because we all enjoy doing it as well and, you know, we're always good if we have to miss one so you know the fact that all three of us are going to be on with our patrons is wonderful and we just geek out about all kinds of things i mean i'm sure i'm gonna have some pickups to show off from pixel heaven you know when i get back from that um obviously ravi's off to format you've just done your gaming market as well a lot of stories to tell about that but really we just kind of you know we hang out with mates really you know we have a great community sometimes up to about 40 people jump on the hangout and you know when we get new people on we always invite you to kind of show off your home gaming setup you know show us your geek den that's always cool we help each other out you know with, with advice on things we do a lot of nostalgia often talk about movies and music and gadgets anything goes really on the patrons hangout it is an excuse to just nerd out for a couple of hours, once a month or, or twice a month, as it's going to be in June, um, crack a drink open and basically geek out with some like-minded people. We think of it as a bit of a virtual users group. So all patrons are invited to the Hangout. So if you'd like to join us next weekend, now is a very good time to sign up to our Patreon. And also for our gold members and above, we are going to be recording a new episode of the bonus podcast that we do every single month just for our patrons of which there are now, this will be our 36th episode of this, I believe, the Retro Hour After Hours. And we're going to be quizzing each other on the next episode, aren't we? Oh, yeah. God, Mastermind. <laughs> yeah, we're doing an episode of Mastermind, but all three of us are going for it, and we've all got to pick a subject for the other two to write questions for, and then we are going to uh, see who is the ultimate winner, or just see, you know, you know, bragging rights. They actually know what they know. I, about I can't believe subjects. Dan's picked Amiga already. I'm yeah, Dan, my <laughs> specialist <laughs> subject. <laughs> Dan was literally like, bags the Amiga, <laughs> like straight away. So, so yeah, yeah, Ravi, Ravi's at a bit of a disadvantage, but you know, we'll see how we get on, won't we? <laughs> Yeah, it's just a bit of a giggle, isn't it? So um, this is a podcast that we do just for our patrons and uh, you're going to get a new episode of that release next week as well. And uh, also you get the normal episode early. You know, if I'm going to edit in time most weeks, you get extra, sometimes 10, 15 minutes of extra patrons only news. We've got a bit more news that we're going to do for our patrons in just a second. But really the main reason that you're joining us on Patreon is just to make sure that we can keep bringing out this podcast each and every Friday. Really helps us with all the running costs and everything. And if you'd like to join us now, it's a very good time to do it. All the details are at theretrohour.com. Right then, next, we're going to be going inside the world of edutainment with Arthur creator Mark Brown and his son Tolan Brown. There are special guests next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guests. And uh, what an absolute treat! And uh, such a nostalgic chat that we're going to have this week. Uh, something that really takes us back to our childhood. I mean, so many people grew up watching Arthur, the TV series. And uh, obviously, there was a lot of Arthur video games back in the day that have actually been really launched again for a whole new generation. So we thought to find out, obviously, we're going to talk about the TV show as well, and also about the, the video games that are back for the 21st century. Let's welcome on the creator of Arthur, and uh, also, we're going to welcome on uh, Tolon as well. So we've got Mark Brown, who is, of course, the creator of Arthur, and Tolon, who is the um, the producer on Arthur and also the uh, the VP of on-screen media as well, to find out a bit about the history of Arthur and uh, the games as well. So uh, welcome to the show, guys. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Thank you. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, let's start with you, Mark. I mean, um, yeah. going kind of way back to the, the start of your career, um, I know you started as an illustrator. I mean, how did you initially get started? And were you always drawing things when you were a kid? Were you always into art? I was. I was always drawing in school when I was supposed to be doing my math, getting in trouble for drawing, getting in trouble for daydreaming. And now it's my job. I'd like to go back and talk about my about this with my teachers. You know, I think we should have a discussion. <laughs> be allowed to daydream and doodle. I think that um, you know, drawing uh, for me was a really important way of uh, building a world that I could uh, fantasize within. And you know, little did I realize that this would become my career, my life. And you know, I'd like to talk a minute about where Arthur came from. Mm. Uh, and and now, especially since Tolan is joining us, uh, because this, this happened um, a day back in 1976 when I was teaching at this small college in Boston. And I, I really loved teaching. And the college decided to close. And I remember going home that night terrified. You know, what was I going to do? I had no job. I had this family to take care of. And Tolan asked for a bedtime story. And that's where Arthur was born. So I said, well, there's this little aardvark. And he wanted to know his name. And then he asked for a picture. And I drew this tiny aardvark with a long nose. And that's where the very first story, Arthur's Nose, happened. And I wow. took it to a publisher in Boston, and they said to me, it needs a lot of work. And they were really right. <laughs> it did need a lot of work. I, I think I was using two paragraphs to do what one well-constructed sentence should do in a picture book. Because, you know, with a picture book, you're, you have this delicate balance uh, between the words on one side and pictures on the other. And you, you really want the pictures to do what the words can't do. And yeah. the words should be there to do what the pictures can't do. Yeah, so this little drawing happened with Arthur, and I took it to uh, Little Brown Publishers in Boston. That was the very first book I ever published, Arthur's Nose. And little did I know the adventure that was about to happen. <laughs> I mean, for you, Tolan, that must have been amazing. I mean, we're all, all of our parents, I imagine, you know, read his stories when we were kid and made stories up. But actually having your childhood stories suddenly blow up and be this massive worldwide phenomenon, that must have been quite bizarre to see. Everybody asks about that because of <laughs> what Arthur turned into. But I guess it's it was just a, a, a product of being in the bubble. I didn't realize the significance and also, that was, you know, one among many bedtime stories. Like that, bedtime stories were were uh, just a, a big part of our childhood. We didn't have cable, you know, so we had to <laughs> entertain ourselves by other means. So, um, when you started creating the books, did you have to kind of create this whole world and? lots of different characters and, and you know, build this world that was going to be consistent for Arthur to be in? You know, I, I realized that I could just go back in my own childhood. And now when I think about it, uh, I, I was very brazen. I, I went back to third grade at Lakewood Elementary School, Miss Kingston's class, and I'm, I can put myself back there right now and see the classroom, see the school, the hallways, the scary librarian that used to open the library every Friday afternoon with these blood red fingernails. And we had 15 minutes to walk around this large table and pick out a book for the weekend. And if you didn't find a book within those 15 minutes, you left the library, the door was locked, and you had to wait a week to get back in. But I, I used a lot of my friends uh, as characters in Arthur's world. My best friend, Terry Johnson, who now lives in New Zealand, he became Buster in the stories. Uh, another friend, Alan, became the brain. A little girl I had a crush on 
Patricia Del Porto became Sue Ellen. So there was this cast of characters uh, really existed. And, and, you know, I think that because they were real, it, it helps kids also feel that these characters are real. I, I get letters from kids asking me for Francine's phone number, which I think is <laughs> terrific. <laughs> Well, awesome. um, I was I was wondering what the transition then going from book to television was and how did you kind of help make the show stand out from other shows that were around at the time? Well, well um, the way it happened, I, I was really resistant to do anything on television. Children's television at that time to me was not a great place. The cartoons were very frenetic and there wasn't a lot of educational substance to them. But when PBS came to me and asked to put Arthur on television, they had a really interesting agenda. They wanted to use animation and television to make kids want to read, to make them want to go to the library. And I thought that was a wonderful mission to use these two very seductive elements in children's lives, television, animation, for something that was good. And I also, as a parent, uh, was very impressed by the work of Fred Rogers. Uh, and I always liked the way he used television to be helpful to kids and families. And so that sort of, I adopted that uh, mission with Arthur. And then I found out I could also have fun with these stories. And I was lucky enough to work with wonderful writers. And um, this whole world started to evolve. The more we explored these characters, uh, the whole world of Arthur expanded in really fun and unexpected ways. Well, I mean, over the years since, you know, Arthur began as an animated series in the 90s, um, I imagine you transitioned from was it traditional animation at first? Did that move into digital? I mean, how much of a role do computers play in the production process? Well, Tolan could probably talk better to that because he was more involved with the animation. It was difficult. I, um, I mean, related to to your previous question, I think one one of the things that set Arthur apart was just um, my dad was so involved in the you know, development of the, sh of the show. And with that came translating his, uh, picture book style, you know, with the art over into animation. And that kind of necessarily made it look different than everything mm. that was on TV, you know, because it was trying to replicate that, that look again. And, um, it, that was a lot easier to do when it was traditional animation. Because yeah. you, you had to draw everything by hand and paint the backgrounds and do all that. So the, the, it was easier to achieve the painterly style with that. I think we may have been the last traditional 2D animation holdouts on children's television. Uh, we held out for a very long time. But was there a, a lot of pressure to kind of, um, you know, go digital and uh, kind of, um, uh, there, you know, increase resolution and quality and stuff like that? Yeah, there was. And that that was an interesting thing, too. You know, with the longevity of the show, we, we for a while, we lost a bunch of the early episodes in the uh, uh, seasons in the in the tra transition from SD to HD. Uh, because it just wasn't there. Actually, the BBC, I think, was the only one to have them for a while because they redigitized them. I think we probably got a little pressure at the time to switch over to computer animation, which at that time was, you know, mainly just Flash. And, um, and then we had to because there were no other options. Like you just could, <laughs> you just couldn't <laughs> find anybody to do 2D animation anymore. It was all computers. So we eventually had to jump ship. And it was it was a learning process for sure. Kind of we essentially had to reinvent everything. Yeah, you're making me think of that first meeting up in Montreal with the animation company, where all of a sudden uh, this wor little world of Arthur that exploded uh, and grew exponentially into this world that was animated, all of a sudden the characters moved. 
they were asking me things like, well, what does Arthur sound like? How does Arthur walk? Where is his house in relation to Buster's house? Where's his school? I had to draw a map of the city. Uh, and I also felt very strongly that I didn't want this show to be just about Arthur. I didn't want him to be the focus. I wanted mm. the world to be this ensemble cast where his family, his friends were just as important as Arthur. And uh, I think that is what maybe kids relate to the most because this world is like their own. And, mm. you know, they, they're they part of, of, of his world. Uh, a reporter once asked me to describe Arthur in just a few words. And I thought for a minute and I thought, well, he's this eight-year-old aardvark who is navigating the mud puddles of life. And, you know, he doesn't always do it well, but, you know, what eight-year-old does, actually? He needs help from his family. He needs help from his friends to get through difficult situations. And, uh, you know, I, I think that everyone who knows Arthur knows that he's a good friend and he has a good heart. And I think, you know, kids relate to that. Ian, talking about the production side of it, Turlo, maybe you can um, fill us in a bit more on kind of the technical side of it. I mean, what, what software packages did you start to use initially then when you, you were transitioning over to digital? Well, it, it, initially it was, it was Flash, and then we moved into uh, Harmony Toon Boom. By virtue of the process, it, it, it sort of flattened, flattens things out in a way that we weren't accustomed to, I think, with uh, you know, the, the visual style of the show as it existed. So a lot of work went into recreating that, you know, painterly style from, from the books and from the show, you know, uh, that, which had already at that point been on for a number of seasons. And kids noticed too, we got lots of letters from, from kids who wondered what was happening. The look of mm. Arthur had changed and they didn't necessarily like the flatness. They wanted that rich, uh, watercolory background and environment. And then, you, then you all you had sort of a generational shift too. So, like mm -hmm. at the at the beginning of Arthur, it was all these, you know, artists coming up through mainly these art schools in Canada with with these great animation programs, and they could all draw. You know, it was such a. I I, I actually when when I went to go work on the show because I came from a a live action film background. I had, I had to learn a lot of things about animation. Um, so I was, was able to go up to Montreal and, and, you know, hang out in the studio where it was, where we were making Arthur for a while and just learn all the, all the parts to it. And it was just, you could just throw a rock in that place and you were guaranteed to hit an amazing artist. <laughs> You know, they yeah. could they could draw in any style, and it was just a, it was a remarkable place, and um, and doing it all by hand. You know, there were pencil sharpeners on everybody's table, and then you know, with the the shift to um, to computer, the skill set of all the artists changed. You know, so everybody was only drawing on a tablet, and then you got to the space where that's all they knew was was drawing on a tablet. So to to get to the painterly style, you know, it was it was like um, they didn't have a reference point for the <laughs> for what yeah. <laughs> painterly was, so it was trying to recreate this thing that they they weren't familiar with. Maybe I I was wondering how um, you kind of got into the world of of vi video games as well, because there was a lot of other franchises like The Simpsons that had started doing lots of games. There were lots of these kind of titles come out. Um, uh, how did you kind of hear about this industry and uh, uh, then you know, branch into it? When when Arthur became a television star, his his world of fans um, just grew exponentially. I was focused on the books, making more books, because all of a sudden, the audience that I was writing for, the three to five-year-olds, grew... Uh, to a younger audience, kids who were pre-readers. So I was making board books for that audience. And then there were better readers who wanted chapter books 
about Arthur. So I had to concentrate on that. And then in the, in the midst of all of this, uh, this licensing program exploded. And, you know, Bill Gates was uh, sending private planes to fly my licensing agent around. And he wanted to create this Arthur and DW animatic uh, that connected to uh, kids' computers and televisions and had a, I forget the thousands of words of vocabularies. That, and so I was entering this world that was very new uh, to me and exciting and terrifying at the same time. And, and that's when Living Books approached me about translating the Arthur books into books that kids could actually enter and play with. And I, I loved the flexibility of this medium where kids could read at their own speed. They could touch a word and the word would explain to them what that meant and how it was pronounced. Uh, it, it just, it made reading, the experience of reading so much richer and more exciting for kids. So yeah, when, when they approached me, I didn't even own a computer. And so they sent me a computer and then flew from California to Boston where I was living, showed me how to use the computer and <laughs> showed me how, it, how these games work. Because I was like on the fence, I don't know about this new uh, idea about these books. And, and I was immediately drawn in and saw the exciting potential there for kids. It, it was really interesting because uh, Living Books was also a broader bund who did a, a yeah. you know, a, a lot of titles as well. And I think those kind of animated games and that edutainment was really important to the PC market because a lot of justification of people we've had on the podcast has been they got a computer because their parents thought it would help with education and uh you know bringing that in did you ever get like packaged with anything or did it did it you know uh, come in a bundle or anything any of the alpha titles um actually i don't know about that about how how they were marketed you know but i i just dealt with them as a one-on-one -on -one situation i i'm really surprised that they are still so relevant and useful to children and now we're talking about adding to the library of, of these living books. And I, th I think that's very exciting. And Toland's involved also with um, the television program and building games that relate, educational games that relate to the show so they can extend what the kids watch on the screen um, and take it to their own private screen and continue um, the story storylines in, in ways that they can control and have fun with. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's funny. The, uh, I mean, Arthur, again, from just the, the period in time and the, and with the longevity of the show, it, um, you know, all that unfolded at the same time, there were all these huge, you know, advancements in technology and, and just the, what was possible and also what was accessible to people at that, like even, um, the broader bond living books thing, you, you know, you were talking about what was it like to be in the space with all these other characters? Uh, there weren't any, there, there wasn't a lot <laughs> when, when Arthur started. I think Arthur was the, the first for, uh, living books, you know, for, for a branded character. And then prior to that, it was, um, it was just, Carmen San Diego and and like uh, Oregon Trail on a green tinted monochrome screen, Lisa on a school computer, yeah, on floppy disks, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in the computer <laughs> lab at your school. Yeah, so, I was wondering about that because obviously you mentioned Mark that you, you weren't a computer user. I mean, tell them that you, you'd have been the age where, like you mentioned, you played stuff like Oregon Trail at, at school. I mean, did, did you have to kind of convince your father a bit that this was a worthwhile medium? Were, were you excited about it coming to computer screens? Was I? Oh, absolutely, and it's, and especially the fact that it was broader bun because they they kind of uh, they had that space sewn up, you know, the edutainment space. And uh, it was right around the time when I think to try to convince Mark to do living books, uh, they 
they sent Mist. Do you remember that game, Mist? Yeah, CD-ROM game. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. it's a pioneering game. That one was. Yeah, yeah. it was, it, and it was at like your mind was just blown when you pop that thing into the plastic CD caddy and then put it in the and then waited three minutes for it to load and got into that <laughs> to that world and started clicking around and solving puzzles. I mean, it was like nothing you had ever seen before. So it, I think once. Once you had a chance to see what was possible, it it was a pretty easy ask. Well, do you remember any limitations that the early 90s PC hardware had when it came to translating the characters to a game? Were there any kind of technical hurdles in the way? My reaction was the characters felt a little stiff. I was wishing that they could do more. I wish that the animation was a little richer, which it certainly has exploded in, in that direction. But, uh, you know, those were my reactions uh, visually, mostly visually at first. But I don't know, maybe Tolan, you had other reactions. Oh, no. You know, again, for me, coming from that was, you know, just when you were beginning to see what video games were going to become, you know. So so for me, it was coming from the green screen Oregon Trail world to living books it was you know it was a huge step forward so i I didn't look (laughs) didn't look at it as being you know not good enough for for me it was like oh wow this is amazing and uh how how much like freedom did they have at living books was there a a kind of brief that they had to stick to and uh was everything you know checked uh so they couldn't you know change the characters or the or the storylines and it had to be all consistent. I didn't really know enough about what the potential was, what the limitations were. So I would, you know, make uh, notes about how uh, this was. I, I, can we do this? Can we do that? I, I remember hiding uh, things within the um, illustrations in the living books that kids could find and click on and they would move and. It was a surprise element. Um, And, you know, I think that that was kind of suggested from my picture books where I would hide Tolan's names and my my other kids uh, within the illustrations. And when I would visit a school and talk to kids and teachers and librarians, that was the thing that they most loved about these books, that they could find these names hidden somewhere within the illustrations. Uh, so uh, I really enjoyed that element being translated to the living books, and and that was the concept to to bring the book to life. I think right out of the gate, that's what they wanted to do. So they so they hewed pretty closely to the books. That was the starting point. Did you um, come under any pressure to add stuff like junk food in there? Because I know at the time uh, a lot of other video games uh, about kids. There was a huge kind of advertising swell of um like you know products and sweets and all of that kind of stuff going into there did you, feel, did you get any pressure or were you kind of protected by uh living books from that really oh uh, we were protected um i don't remember anything like that but it's certainly something that would have uh bumped up against me if we, if mm. we were asked to do something like that i mean i'm just uh horrified by the way television has used uh, seduced children with animation and with commercials that get them to want to eat certain kinds of things or buy certain kinds of toys. So I had a, a, a natural resistance to that when I entered the world of licensing. I had this contract with an agent at the time, so I was kind of locked in to this world where I was constantly bumping up against things I didn't want to do, I didn't want Arthur to be a part of. And it took that three-year cycle for me to be able to uh, fire this agent and sort of scale back uh, the licensing. So Arthur was associated with puzzles and games and things that were helpful to kids. It sounds that's a really interesting point there. So obviously you, you kept that creative control and you knew kind of the boundaries you wanted to set for, you know, the world of Arthur. Yeah. Um, 
but also, how did you find, you know, obviously making, working with the guys on a video game, did you have to strike a balance between education and entertainment when developing these games? You know, I didn't know anything else. I, I wanted it both. I, I believe that kids learn best with humor. That's where my books came from. Uh, there was always some kind of educational uh, or learning element within the books. I had an agenda with every story for kids. And and that's what we did with the television show. Kids ask me, where do your ideas come from? And they, it's so easy. It, they come from real life. Things that happened to my kids would become stories. I remember Tolan when he was about five. He wanted to go to day camp, but he was a little afraid of leaving home for the day and being you know, in some place strange with strange people. And from that experience and watching him struggle with that came the book, Arthur Goes to Camp. And then uh, my other son, Tucker, when he was in second grade, he wanted desperately to lose a tooth. Everyone in his class, I think, had lost teeth. And so he was trying to wiggle teeth that wouldn't wiggle and that turned into another Arthur story, Arthur's Tooth. So, you know, I explained to kids that there are great stories around us every day. We just have to keep our eyes open, our ears open, and find something to uh, start that story within us and then have fun with it. And basically, that's my job. And, and a lot of that comes from just... Um... I guess this is this would be the ad advice to creators out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, part of how that hap Arthur, how Arthur happened and evolved was um, having uh, participating in ha in how it grew and having a north star for you know what your own principles are and and how they relate to the thing that you created and not. Com completely handing it over to other people. And then hopefully you can get some of those people to care about this thing in the, in the same way that you do. And you can all work together to make something cool. So Arthur was what it was with the licensing program and with the, you know, the video games, with the show, with the books, because they, they reflected, you know, that those desires to, to teach and to teach in a yeah. way that wasn't pedantic or, you know, preachy or any of that kind of stuff, but just approach the world as a learning experience. So, you know, Tolan, you're, you're making me think of, well, when Arthur made this transition from books to animation and being up in Montreal, we had spent the entire day with the animators and the director and everyone was ready to go out to dinner and I had a stack of drawings that the animators had done in front of me. And they gave me a blue pencil. And I was correcting the way the various characters looked and redrawing for the animators with the blue pencil. And it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? These are good drawings. And they're not going to be exactly the way I want them always. I All of a sudden, I have entered this world that was very private, where I controlled everything about Arthur and his world in, in the books. But now um, I was working with this team of really gifted, creative, talented people. And for me, it was this big learning experience, this door open that I didn't realize was going to lead to something so wonderful and exciting by being a part of a team uh, at, rather than, you know, this solitary experience in my studio. Um, so for me, that was one of the big lessons that I learned uh, about animation and television, uh, working with a team. And the same thing happened with, with the television stories you know, we're always looking for something that is helpful to kids and families. And mm. I kind of ran out of ideas pretty early on after they adapted all the, the books I had written. But then, you know, other families uh, were 
working on on the Arthur show would say, oh, my kids got head lice from sports at school, changing jerseys. And, and so all of a sudden, these brilliant writers that we were working with came up with a story uh, about head lice that was funny, that it was helpful. And, you know, that's what we did for 25 years. I, I still can't believe that Arthur it became the longest running animated children's show in history. I mean, they're talking about the, the video game aspect of it as well. And this is maybe something that you, you can spot a difference in compared to books and television. I mean, the video game medium itself, I mean, do you think that can really enhance the storytelling experience of, of your books, especially for young readers? I mean, does that give it kind of a whole extra angle, that, that interaction? Oh, absolutely. I mean, to have a book move, kids must come to these games and book experiences on the screen uh, the way I did at, at first, you know, when I was asked to move Arthur from picture books to television, I was very resistant. And I, I realized very quickly that the experience was very similar to creating a picture book, to creating um, a television program. You know, I would write my script, cast my characters, I would costume them. I would build sets for them. But in a book, I had to stop frame what I was seeing in my mind that was moving and, and what I was hearing. And with, with television, with, with these living books, I, I don't have to do that. The characters can move and kids can control those things. Uh, it's a, more, a little miracle, actually. Yeah, and I guess the fact they can take it at their own pace as well, you know, yeah, playing it on a yeah, video Yeah, I love game. that. Yeah. That mm. reluctant readers especially mm. could go into these books and make reading exciting for them rather than being resistant to learning how to read. And to me, that was the selling feature when living books first came to me. Well, Arthur's always been very innovative when it comes to technology. You kind of touched before on um, Microsoft's Actimates, these interactive toys. And there's there an Arthur one in 1997. So for those who aren't familiar with those, what were Actimates? How did they work? And how did you partner with Microsoft then? What kind of happened there? Um, well, it, Bill Gates actually uh, came to us. He knew of Arthur from television. I don't know whether he has children or or what, but he saw the potential of kind of connecting technology with um, this character and what kids were taking in through the books and through the television program. And so he had this idea that uh, he would create these, it was like a stuffed animal that um, would connect to a computer, connect to the television set, and, and kids could talk to it build stories, uh, build their vocabulary through this toy. But, you know, my first reaction was that it was very elitist. Uh, it was, number one, expensive. Not oh. all families could afford this. Uh, so I had I had a problem with it right from the start. And, you know, you, you would buy the Actimate, but then you had to buy another component in order to com connect to your computer, another component you had to buy to connect with your television set. So it became really expensive for, for families. And I think that's, you know, one reason that it didn't do connect uh, in a stronger way with kids. But now I'm sure they could do a similar thing for, for a much more affordable price. Well, um, Tolon, do you think that... Um edutainment games are a bit a bit kind of underrated but actually they've really helped with development of stuff like interfaces and um the kind of multimedia area that we that we now see you know children picking up ipads and being able to you know use them instantly and stuff uh, was that kind of foundation laid by uh, edutainment oh it, it, absolutely i mean it, it it ushered in just how video games made you think, especially at um, how they began. And I, I, it still exists now, just in a more advanced form. But it just, um, it was introduced a whole different kind of problem solving. You know, it was this puzzle based uh, approach to figuring things out. And 
obviously pretty tailor made for the for the edutainment space. But I think that just kind of naturally occurs in the medium to a certain degree. I mean, there the you know for every Super Mario Brothers, there's you know a mist or something like that 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 really leans into that kind of. And I guess uh, Super Mario Brothers is still forcing you to solve problems, you yeah, know, in yeah. its own way. I guess the interfaces as well over the time get more and more refined and easier for children to to use and interact with. And, and you know, you're making me think of how quickly this is happening for kids. Yeah, I, it was just 15 years ago. I was standing in front of 2,000 educators at a university here in the United States. And uh, I had slides I was using in my presentation holding an iPad. And I, I said to the, the teachers, how many of you, raise your hand if you think this is a good way for a child to take in a story? No one raised their hand in the wow. entire room. And I was shocked because, you know, I could see from – my limited experience with kids in schools and taking in stories on on iPads or on their computer, how exciting that was for them. So, I mean, in just 15 years, look where we've, <laughs> where we've it's, come. It's really like second nature now. So I, I, I worked in an exhibition space and we had a, a TV screen, which was, um, you know, it wasn't interactive, but we'd have toddlers run up and just start hitting it straight away to see which elements they can start to change <laughs> yeah it's it, it's amazing the, the ubiquity of that technology and how easily it is to slide into letting it become part of your life you know it's interesting how you mentioned that that change there and i mean particularly you know if we go back to when the, the first arthur games came out you know 30 years ago now i mean you, you know now it does seem like you know every kid's got a, a tablet or a you know a nintendo switch or something like that and today i think parents understand the more you know the educational value and that they can learn things from them but i remember like 30 years ago often you'd read articles in newspapers about how kids are becoming zombies by sitting in front of Super Mario Brothers and stuff like that. Was there ever any resistance from parents who didn't really understand the medium and didn't really see the value in it as a learning tool initially? Did, did that kind of change? Well, you know, I equate that to the mail I get from people, from fan, Arthur fans. It now is almost equally divided between parents and kids. I'm getting mm. just as many letters from adults who loved Arthur, who grew up with Arthur, and I think that must be the same with uh, the way we're experiencing uh, taking in information now through technology. We now have parents who grew up with this technology who have mm. kids, and it, it's part of their world. It's just part of their family experience. Well, amazingly, yeah, even if people haven't seen the um, Arthur series, they've probably seen online the meme of uh, Arthur's Arthur's fist. <laughs> what, what, what did you think when that became popular? Yes, uh, 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 and you're making me want to share with you uh, another interesting project that's in the works, and it's an Arthur feature film, which kind of began with that meme of the fist, the Arthur fist. And who knew that this image would uh, connect with so many young adults who grew up with Arthur in such a powerful way as a symbol to express themselves. I mean, I first uh, knew of it uh, from, oh, who was it? Was it Michael Jordan? Maybe? Oh, LeBron, it was LeBron. LeBron James, yes. He started using it on, in his social media, and it just... And, you know, John Legend thinks he's Arthur, and I see him posting <laughs> pictures next to Arthur. It, it's pretty amazing to me. It, and I have to say, by relative to the standards of the internet, the, <laughs> the memes have been remarkably respectful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by, by and large, which is not, not the case. But it's Yeah, like, it's, it's probably one of the most innocent memes yeah. online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ge generally it's it's the case um you know compared to some some of the others but that you know i think and i think part of that is because arthur over he predated memes you know so that was this was uh, arthur was like uh everybody's first experience for a lot of these things you know arthur mm -hmm. was one of the first 
memes for even prior to the, you know, the fist meme. Uh, the living books were a lot of people's first introduction to, you know, software at home that you could play on your computer that was you know, like a game. It, it, so, uh, you know, we everybody grew up with these things along with Arthur. So they they sort of got integrated in people's lives in maybe a little different way than they do now. And I mean, today as well, I mean, a whole new generation of kids now can play these living books as uh, they are back um, available on Zoom platform and also uh, coming to the Nintendo Switch as well. Um, Arthur's Birthday, Arthur's Computer Adventure, Arthur's Reading Race, Arthur's Teacher Trouble are all available now. How does it feel to have these games introduced to a whole new generation and transitioning to these new platforms? Well, it's very exciting. Um, you know, just as the television show connecting with it, still connecting with adults who grew up with Arthur. I mean, that's pretty amazing to me. But, but you know, it wasn't by accident that that happened. We wanted parents and caregivers to watch and experience Arthur together because, you know, when you are sharing a book or a video game or television show with your child, you have this opportunity to share your values, to have conversations. And, you know, that's always what I dream of uh, because we plant adult humor within all of the Arthur stories that parents, I think, get a chuckle out of and it draws them into the program. So they will uh, experience it with their kids. So uh, I always look for opportunities to bring adults into the picture so that there is a conversation that can happen from these stories. Well, you mentioned about the feature film there as well. I mean, is, is there any plans to do any more Arthur video games as well? Is that kind of on the radar? No, oh, I think there's going to be a lot of Arthur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's <laughs> now entering this new uh, world where he has uh, parents who grew up with him and they're sharing Arthur with their kids. And I think there's also an opportunity to age Arthur up a little bit. Mm. So that he is experiencing things at a slightly older age. I, I think there are opportunities for us to be helpful to kids and families to talk about social media and mm. what kids are experiencing, struggling with. It's, a, it's another way to be helpful. That, that would be incredibly helpful for people nowadays. Yeah. To- uh, that's that's a, a new agenda that Tolan and I are tackling. I think that proves the longevity of the character as well, that he's remained relevant for so long. Yeah, so, um, pretty amazing. Yeah, that is fantastic. Well, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both. And if uh, people want to check out the uh, the re-release of The Living Books, I'll, uh, I'll put a link in our show notes as well. I've just got to say, guys, we I've done this podcast now for eight years. My wife generally doesn't get impressed at my podcast, but when I mentioned I was chatting to you, she was completely starstruck because she grew up watching <laughs> oh, Arthur. So uh, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Hello to yeah. her. Yeah. <laughs> well, best of luck with it all, guys. Thank you so much, Mark and Telon. It's been a pleasure chatting to you both. Oh, great questions. It was a pleasure for us. Thank you for caring. Thank you.